As a screenwriter, Paul Schrader was a powerful source of stories for his new Hollywood contemporaries. Having written The Yakuza for Sidney Pollock, Obsession for Brian De Palma, the first script of Close Encounters of the Third Kind for Steven Spielberg, and two of Martin Scorsese's masterpieces with Taxi Driver and Raging Bull, all ensure that his name will never be forgotten in the annals of cinema. Having not seen a movie until the age of 18, due to his strict Calvinist upbringing, Schrader began to devour cinema. Starting as a film critic, Schrader eventually came out from beneath the shadows of his talented friends to become an exciting auteur in his own right. Movies such as Blue Collar, Hardcore and Patty Hearst explored the change in American morality and ideology by tackling difficult subjects with Schrader's signature intelligence and insight. Turn it off. It would be the highly influential American gigolo that marked a new decade exploring the materialism and individualism of the 80s where money and possessions have replaced love. Richard Gere plays the stylish male escort, Julian Kay, who caters to the needs of wealthy clients in a slickly realized Los Angeles. Things take a turn when he's accused of murder following an appointment with some powerful clients who are into kinkier sex play. Slap that cunt. Julian pays the price for his superficial existence and quickly runs out of friends and opportunities as he tries to stay ahead of the law. It's only the love of a client, Michelle, played by Lauren Hutton, that he might be able to escape the trap he finds himself in. Loneliness has followed me my whole life, everywhere. In bars and cars, sidewalks, stores, everywhere. There's no escape. And God's a lonely man. Paul Schrader is a master of conveying solitude. American Gigolo is part of his canon of work that could be called his God's Lonely Man series, which includes Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, Light Sleeper, and most recently, First Reformed. Beer to Taxi, A Boxing Ring, Insomnia, and Faith. Each film uses powerful metaphors to convey not only the character's alienation and loneliness, but also their existential crises. Schrader's characters are usually unhappy, tormented souls who are seeking purpose and redemption in their lives. Their occupations provide the vehicle to play out this conflict and culminate in self-destructive acts that will hopefully end their anguish. Doesn't it ever bother you, Julian? What? What you do. Giving pleasure to women. I'm supposed to feel guilty about that. But it's not legal. Legal is not always right. Men make laws, sometimes they're wrong. <laughs> Julian is similar in that being a gigolo defines him. He doesn't believe in love. Love is just a tool to get what he wants. Out of all of Schrader's lonely men, he seems to be the only one that doesn't seem as tormented. If anything, he's the rare character who seems to enjoy his life. When we meet Julian, he's a confident, freewheeling man about town. He's not trying to escape his life. If anything, by investing in his body and mind, by working out and learning new languages, he's further investing in his lifestyle so that he can maintain it. Julian is a professional. He knows how to show love to his clients, but ironically, he doesn't appear to feel love. He keeps himself detached and his emotions hidden behind the perfect surface. The material world of American Gigolo is one of stylish surfaces and status symbols. The film is responsible for the popularity of Italian fashion designer Giorgio Armani in America, as Julian is predominantly decked out in stylish Armani suits as he peacocks about town, almost as if he's walking down a catwalk. His wardrobe is like his armor, and he chooses them carefully in order to deliver the sophisticated image that gives Julian the edge over his competition. Along with his clothes, Julian's convertible Mercedes and stylish apartment complete the look, conveying Julian's narcissism, and throughout the film, we see him in mirrors, admiring his own reflection. When Travis Bickle and Jake LaMotta look into the mirror, they're confronted with their loneliness. But for Julian, his reflection not only shows his comfort in his detachment and solitude, but ultimately his reflection reinforces his power. I love to be with you. I love it when you kiss me, and when you touch me. But when you make love, you go to work. For Julian, sex is power. It gives him his life, his meaning, and without it, he's nothing. Sex, love, and intimacy are transactions, a commodity to be traded for power and money. Julian's power as a lover gives him access to wealth, but also it gives him power over people that are ordinarily more powerful than him. Julian is a product that's to be consumed. He offers his wares to the highest bidder and plays his role well telling clients what they want to hear and giving them the illusion of love. Bye, you're amazing.
making me thirsty just standing there. Now you can open the champagne. Pour me a drink. Set the bottle down. He's a prophet and a pusher. Partly truth, partly fiction. Walking contradiction. Julian is a contradictory character, and it's these contradictions where the conflicts begin to arise. But we also learn what's most important to him. As much as he's in it for the money, Julian doesn't want to feel like he can be bought. He doesn't want to be cheap or viewed as a possession. I forgot you, uh, you got scruples now. Huh? I don't like playing the same numbers too often. They get possessive. I can't be possessed. When he first meets Michelle, there's an obvious attraction and connection between them. The fact that they both speak French breaks the ice, but when Michelle tries to solicit his services, he backs away. Shortly after, Michelle appears at Julian's apartment and Julian is taken aback as to how she tracked him down, but also because his apartment is his sanctuary, where he stays separate from business and the outside world. This is my apartment. Women don't come here. This shows us Julian's need for privacy, but the irony is, that as an escort, he has to be both visible and invisible in order to be attractive to his clients. They have a need for discretion. They want Julian's company, but frankly, none of the scandal. After he's accused of murder, it's the potential scandal that begins to destroy everything he holds dear as discretion, privacy, and friendships all fade away as he's pulled into the spotlight. These are very delicate matters. Things that may not fall under the exact letter of the law. Publicity is the last thing I want. I never did anything for you. What are you talking about? I'm your number one boy. And you fight me every turn. You ask a favor, and then stand up and you work for six months to set up. I explained it already. I told you. I'm through with you, Julie. You'll have to fend for yourself. I don't care what happens to you anymore. With the police circling Julian as the prime suspect, he needs an alibi to clear his name. Merely protesting his innocence isn't enough. Sadly, no one will come forward for him. His two main fixers, Anne and Leon, are reluctant to help him as it's bad for business. But it also seems that Julian's arrogance and self-serving lifestyle has finally caught up with him. From this point on, Julian enters a world of darkness. His apartment, which was once open and bright, is now depicted as a dark cage, a trap, as the shadows of the Venetian blind resemble a cell foreshadowing his fate later on. His perfect image begins to crumble before our very eyes as he trashes his apartment and car, as he looks for planted evidence, as he desperately tries to hold on to his life, paranoid and alone. He cruises the LA streets in a bland rental car as he drives into the night, seeking help and looking like a shadow of his former self. Sure, you look terrible. Listen, you want to clean up, get a shave? I'm starting to bug you this time of the morning. I've been looking for you. I'm listening. You got my alibi ready? After Leon refuses to give Julian his alibi, a fight breaks out, which ends up with Julian accidentally killing Leon, resulting in Julian's arrest. Trapped behind bars, with no one else to turn to, salvation comes in the form of Michelle. She's the one pure thing in Julian's life and genuinely appears to love him. So much so that in the only selfless act in a film full of self-consumed people, she braves scandal and her social standing for him and provides him with an alibi that will ultimately clear his name. It's a powerful moment and an expression of true love that ironically, Julian can't feel because he's behind glass. He reciprocates with powerful words, suggesting that he's moved by her sacrifice and love. However, that barrier is still there. It's taken me so long to come to you. As moving as the ending is, there's some ambiguity there. I can't help but wonder if Julian has played Michelle all along. Perhaps Julian is guilty of the murder. He never denies it when confronted in private or by police. You did it, didn't you? What? The Ryman killing. And when he first reads about the death, he doesn't seem that worried and quickly brushes it off, even though he's likely to be a suspect. Julian plays the role of a framed man and uses it for effect in order to get an alibi. It's here that he potentially commits to stringing Michelle along 
Julian is a player after all. He takes on roles and he knows how to manipulate women and control them through their desires. By making himself unattainable to Michelle, he makes himself more desirable to her. I said I thought it would be easier. What would be easier? To be with you. Procure you. I told you, you're mistaken. Julian's desire for Michelle is never quite convincing. Schrader films their love scene in a very formal and cold manner, suggesting Julian's detachment. And throughout, Julian is slowly convincing Michelle to leave her husband, which would again help if he needed an alibi. When Julian finally meets Michelle's husband, he's accused of blackmail, which further suggests that he's plotting his freedom. Ultimately, Julian is not after love, he doesn't need it. His quest to clear his name is about maintaining his way of life and ultimately his identity and he will do anything and use anyone to do so. It's all I'm good at. That's not true. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I can't quit any. If I quit, I'm out on a limb. How we be even? I'm already out on the glass partition at the end represents the barriers he puts up. He's still at a distance. When Michelle tells him that she loves him, he again appears to be playing a role. His response seems inauthentic. It seems like a smooth line, not a declaration of love. By the end of the movie, we as the audience have also become jaded like Julian, and perhaps we don't believe in love either. And in that closing moment, we're merely watching two people that need something from each other. Another transaction where the currency is again love in exchange for his life. So that's my take on American Gigolo. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Don't worry about anything. If I can take care of you, I know what you want.